Hi, welcome to Chinese Church in Christ South Valley. We're so glad you're here this morning, and please join us in singing these couple songs. next song is You Are So Holy, and it's a song that we used to sing back in the day when I was in middle school, um, but in the past week, um, it came to mind, and it was a really comforting song, song for me, so I um, hope it can comfort you as well, and we can worship God together with this song. to now. 
Father God, uh, Lord, we just come before you and we declare that you are powerful, Lord, that you are wonderful, um, that you are beautiful. And God, we just stand in awe before you um, and your power and your might and um, your sovereignty, um, all that we don't understand. Um, but we just marvel, Lord, and we worship you for who you are. And God, I just thank you that you are still in control, Lord, um, even in all that happens. Um, I just thank you that we can bring it all to you. So, God, we just praise you this morning, Lord. Um, we acknowledge who you are, Lord, that you are good, um, that you are love, that you are God reigning in heaven, um, and that we are just man. Um, Lord, I pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear what you have to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be with you today um, on this Sunday. Um, we're still towards the beginning of the new year, and at the turn of each uh, calendar year, we often like to introduce to you our church theme for the coming year. And as many of you know, uh, we've been through a lot, um, both as a, just as a world um, in this past year, um, but also for our church family hitting closer to home and a lot of difficult things that we've had to experience together. Um, and so that's why we want to uh, just, we want to hear what God has to say um, at the start of this new year um, and what our, what our church theme is going to be for the year 2021. And so um, in talking to uh, Rupert, our, one of our elders, our senior pastor of our church, um, as we kind of discussed uh, just um, things that we felt were important um, as a group, as a leadership, um, God really put this theme on his heart. And our theme for the 2021 calendar year is this, be prepared. And if there's a colon after that, what we mean by be prepared is growing our faith in Christ. That's our theme for 2021, to be prepared and for and the way to do that, to be able to grow our faith in Christ. Now, why is this important? Um, if you've ever heard me preach during uh, anywhere uh, close to when the new year has happened, um, I'm never a big fan of New Year's. I try to go to sleep before the ball drops because, um, you know, it. a lot of people like to celebrate. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but uh, a lot of times I think we subscribe to this idea that just because the calendar changes, that something new and different and better is going to happen. And I don't think that's ever been more true than this year, given what the year 2020 was like. For, for us as individuals, um, for our world, just the challenges with the pandemic that continue uh, to be a huge um, challenge for us to face, just kind of as humanity. And a lot of times we think if the calendar year just changes, then things will get better. And if you were glued to the news the way I was this week, at least in what's going on in our country, um, it doesn't seem that a magical change in the last digit of our year has actually made a big difference. There are still difficult things that uh, we see uh, every day on the news, um, particularly in just the, circum the political circumstances surrounding our country, um, but also just the state of the pandemic as uh, the world continues to deal with it. And maybe for us, even closer to home, in the tragedy that we've experienced in losing our brother, Michael Huang, one of our college students, at far too young an age, um, as we would think, um, from a human perspective. Um, I think it shows us all the more importance of why God has put this theme on uh, Elder Rupert's heart, that we need to be prepared. And in all of the difficulties and all of the things that make us anxious and all of the questions that we have, that we need to grow our faith in Jesus Christ. And what, what um, in processing what I've seen on TV and also trying to process uh, my own grief and my own uh, just devastation and losing someone close to me, um, it has shown me so much uh, that we really need each other as the body of Christ. Now, if that's our theme for this year, to be prepared to grow our faith in Christ, um, this is not the only way we're going to do it, but starting today, we're, we are going to embark on a new sermon series 
um, just for the next couple weeks. Um, and I want to introduce to you uh, the title of that. And our new ser- sermon series, um, just for the coming weeks, is this. Being the body. Being the body of Jesus Christ. And what, that, what, what we really want to get into is understanding, especially because so much has changed in this past year, in how we worship together, how we have to do it virtually for the most part, and we can't meet together in person, what does it mean to be the body of Christ? And if we are constantly flooded by our anxieties or our fears of the future or just the uncertainty that we see and what that can do to our minds as individuals, hopefully we can see the importance from God's word of what it means to be the body of Christ. Um, If you were with us, we were in the Gospel of Luke for over a year. It's our tradition to generally pick a book of the Bible and preach through the entire thing. Um, But from time to time, when we believe that God has put something on our hearts um, that's topical, we want to go through it. And so um, as Daniel and I have prayed about what we would do after we finished our series in Luke um, that he finished a couple weeks back, um, God really put it on our hearts to talk about what is church how, like, how do we be the body of Christ, especially given that we have to stay home, that it's more dangerous now than ever, uh, at least in our general area, um, from the danger of uh, just the presence of COVID-19? How do we be the body of Christ during this time? And so I want to read some, the- some verses that will be our theme verses for this series. And so today I'm going to introduce the context to where these verses come from. But over the coming weeks, we will slow it down and talk about some of the different elements that we see in this passage, um, because it really shows us what it means to be the body of Christ. It really helps us understand the purpose of the church, words that I think we need so much during this time. And if our theme for the year 2021 is to be prepared to grow in our faith in Jesus Christ, this is not the only way, but a very important way is to understand the role that us as the church, the local church, CCIC South Valley, can play in one another's lives as we get to live out what it means to be the body of Christ. And hopefully that will prepare us for the challenges that 2021 is sure to bring. So I want to read these verses, and these verses come from the very beginnings of the early church in the book of Acts. And these verses are probably familiar to many of us, Um, But for today, I want to give us the context that led this gathering, that when you read it, it just sounds so encouraging and just so uplifting, especially given kind of the state of our minds and our hearts and our fears of the future. Um, But let me read from Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47. And it says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And when we hear these words, doesn't that sound good? You might be saying, damn, that that really sounds like, you know, what 2019 was like or pre-COVID when we could meet together and and worship God together at church and be present in person. And probably right now, given everything we've endured in this past year and everything that we're facing for our future, we might read these words and think, gosh, this sounds too good to be true. But when we consider the context of where these verses are coming from. I pray that this will help us redefine what it means for us to be the body of Christ. And so when we consider these verses that will be our theme verses for the next several weeks, as we go through, um, as we go through many of the things that I just read um, in, in a little slower and in much greater detail, when we consider the context today, I hope this will introduce us to the importance of why we want to be the body of Christ and why we hope that that would be something that we can experience to be prepared to grow our faith in Jesus Christ. And so the three points that we're going to talk about um, from the context that leads up to this, and there you can also see these elements on display in the verses I read, Um, but it's really these three things. 
being in action, belonging to the body, the body of Christ, and focusing on the promise of Jesus Christ. Being in action, belonging to the body, focusing on the promise of Jesus Christ. If you're looking for a simple way to remember those three things, think A, B, C. Action, belonging, and Christ. And those are really three things that hopefully will give us some context for why we want to take it seriously, what it means to gather together as the church and see the importance in that, even as different and unique as it is right now. So first, what does it mean to be in action? Um, to understand these verses, because I'm sure if you, as you were listening to these verses, or if you're looking, them, looking at them in your Bibles right now, these verses are encouraging. It paints this beautiful picture of the church. And our, our tendency might be to think, gosh, how can we encounter that again under such unique circumstances when church has had to be redefined for us? And so I hope that as we consider the context um, of what led up to this section in the book of Acts, um, that we would see these different truths that might help us get our minds uh, around the idea of how important it is to be the body of Christ. And so um, what I'm going to do today is we are going to read a ton of text. We are going to go over the previous 41 verses that led up to verse 42. There's no way we can look at them in great detail in the time that we have, but hopefully as we understand the context for the beginnings of the early church and how wonderful and encouraging this section sounds, um, that we might get an idea of how this might help us today. And really what we're asking is, how did they get there? If this section of them being together and devoting themselves to God's word, to prayer, to fellowship, and experiencing the power of God, an experience that we might think, wow, that sounds really great for the early church, but how come we don't experience it now? We want to ask ourselves, how did they get there? What's the context? And hopefully that helps us understand this morning, how do we get there? here on January 10th, 2021, as we face many things that we have no uh, experience facing before and when our fears and our, and our anxieties can be high given the state of our world. So first we see this, being in action. And you get this from the start of the chapter. And hopefully by understanding the context, we can see some of what led up to this amazing experience of being the body of Christ. So let's start in verse 1. Um, this is the beginning of chapter 2, and if, you're, if you understand, uh, to understand the context of the book of Acts, we just spent over a year in the Gospel of Luke. The book of Acts is really volume 2 of what Luke is writing. Yes, he wrote a long 24 chapter um, with many verses, uh, uh, account, an orderly account as he calls it in his introduction of what Jesus has done, of what Jesus' ministry um, and life and death and resurrection was like. And Acts is his volume too, which is really a story of how the church began and how the church uh, really got to, as our theme says, be the body of Christ in its early stages. And so at the beginning of chapter 2, um, Jesus has died and resurrected, um, and we have seen that the disciples of Jesus have witnessed the ascension of the resurrected Jesus back up into heaven. And so you can understand for the disciples at this time, they have seen a lot. They've seen challenges, they've seen trials, they've seen Jesus, the one that they were trying to get to know and follow and learn more about his ministry and learn more about the kingdom of God. They've seen him arrested, put on trial, put to death, rise again. There are probably so many different thoughts and also emotions that are going through their minds at this time. And I think there's some confusion for them of trying to figure out in the wake of so many kind of just big events that have happened, what is going on? And they're trying to figure out what had happened. And you know, for us, if you've been watching the news this week, we've seen a monumental event in our country as well. And uh, I think many of us are trying to make sense of the future, trying to make sense of what it means for things to be made right, and asking a lot of questions, um, fearful of who to trust, um, who has trustworthy accounts of things. And there's this confusion that can take place in us. And so one thing that you see from the disciples and also the people who are gathered together at the start of chapter 2 is being present and asking questions about what happened and trying to figure out what happened is actually a really important thing for them to be doing. So we see this starting in the, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, 
and it filled the entire house where they, where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? And so to summarize this, because we're going to go through a ton of text, people, uh, it says devout Jews, but also people who are trying to figure out what happened in the aftermath of Jesus' death and seeming resurrection, um, uh, based on uh, just following him and then witnessing him going back up into heaven. Um, there's just a lot of confusion about figuring out what's happened. And they, they get to experience something powerful together where they're speaking their own languages and somehow they're still able to understand each other and they can't quite understand how that would be possible, right? But in doing so, in trying to figure out who was Jesus, how do we live in light of his death but now his resurrection, and what does the future have in store for us? How do we continue to experience the kingdom of God? The fact that they were together played a huge role in that. And even if they weren't quite certain exactly what happened or how to make sense of it, they could experience the power of what God was doing together. Now, for us, um, when we see difficult things or just monumental things, um, we might have all kinds of, of thoughts in our mind of how to understand them, right? We have a human curiosity towards important things. Um, we might also have a human apathy towards difficult things um, that we see in our world. And so um, the fact that this group of people was together allowed them the possibility to be able to experience what God was doing. And maybe we haven't had an experience quite like this, where it seems like just the, the speaking in many different tongues but understanding each other was just a really powerful experience, and they knew that God had something to do with it. Maybe we've never experienced something like that. But in a time where we're really confused about the future of our world, I pray that we would also be able to consider how has God worked powerfully in our past before? And how would we experience that together in some ways as well? Because when we can do that, when we can remember ways where we knew God was absolutely present, and when we can remember that together, as these beings, as these humans were together trying to figure out what was going on in the aftermath of Jesus' death and resurrection, hopefully it's where we can start to make sense of things that we do not have all the answers for. And so the good thing that both the, the disciples, the apostles, uh, these devout Jews, people who are trying to figure out what's going on in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection, the good thing that they're doing is they're asking questions and they're present in trying to figure out what's going on. They might not perfectly know what's going on, but they are engaged with one another. And that's going to be really important for us to experience what it means to be the body of Christ. If we want to understand what it means to have this beautiful experience of fellowship that we see at the end of chapter 2, we're not going to find that on our own. Each individual person who was here and who was present in the aftermath of Jesus' resurrection, if they decided to just veer off into their own thoughts and try to figure, them, figure things out for themselves, I wonder if they would have had this experience. And as I've tried to figure out what's going on, both from a, a national perspective, as I've watched more news than I normally do this week, because it just felt important to do so, um, but as I've also tried to process my own grief um, over the tragedy that, that we've experienced in um, just in uh, so devastatingly losing our brother Michael, I've noticed the tendency that I have to just want to be alone with my thoughts, not to want to talk to anyone else, to withdraw. And there are ways where being by ourselves are important to process our thoughts. But what I've also learned in this last week is there is an unhealthy amount to which I can do that, where the thing that helps me remember truth, the thing that helps me not completely lose perspective or hope, given difficult things that we see on TV or difficult things that have happened in our lives, is to be present with others. And it hasn't been easy, but what I've learned is there are times where I want to be alone with my thoughts, but I need to allow someone else to help me understand what's going on and be present with them and allow them to care for me. And simultaneously, I've also learned that even in my own struggle of processing just all the thoughts that are on my mind, I can also still be present for other people 
in trying to listen to people, hear, in, hear each other's pain, share in one another's pain, share in one another's confusion, and just have conversation about things. And I've been really thankful for ways I've been able to do that. And in hindsight, I wish I had done that more. Because for all of these people gathered together in Jerusalem, if they had just tried to make sense of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on their own, like wandering out in the fields, out in nature, and not talking to other people, I wonder if they would have been able to have this experience. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't speak to us in the quietness of our own hearts. But what it shows is the importance of being in action and being connected to one another during this time. It was important for everyone trying to make sense of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's important for us now, as we start to consider what does it mean to be the body of Christ? And how can that actually help me experience the goodness that comes from being the body of Christ? We cannot do it on our own. And many times when we are alone with our own thoughts, it is easier for us to feed our own ideas. Things that sometimes might be right, sometimes that might be good perspective. But I know many times when I'm alone with my own thoughts, I can convince myself into believing something that isn't true or isn't helpful. And it just shows the importance of how much we need each other. And so during this time that's probably very confusing and anxious for us for so many reasons, um, one way we can start to apply what we're seeing here in Acts chapter 2 is don't try to do things by yourself. If you are confused or anxious or hurting or in pain, you need someone to listen to you, you need someone to cry with, reach out to someone that you trust. Be together as the, what the makings of the early church, it began with them being together and trying to make sense of what happened together. This is why, even though it's different, gathering together to worship God on a Sunday morning, even over YouTube, as impersonal as it might feel at times, it's important. Gathering together in our different fellowship groups, whether it be our Vertigo group Wednesday night, our youth group Friday night, for those of you in middle school and high school, our men's group, our women's group, different groups that exist in our church, there is so much importance in being together during confusing and anxious times. And that was especially true for the early church. Now, how do we move on from what it means to just be together? How do we allow that to help us even further? And that brings us to our second point this morning, where it really, it, I think it really emphasizes what it means to belong to the body of Christ. And so we're going to see this in the next section. And so um, at the end of verse 8, you see a listing of all the different kind of backgrounds and ethnicities of people who had um, just made this uh, journey and been present in the local area of Jerusalem. Um, and they are trying to figure out together what had happened. And even in different people speaking in different languages and somehow people being able to understand each other, because no one had the answer to what was going on, it comes up in verse 12 where people, verses 12 and 13, where people suspect maybe people have had too much wine and they're under the influence of something and they don't understand what's going on. But this is where being present with one another allowed people to be present for something that they desperately needed to hear from the Apostle Peter that happens next. Now, I said, we're going to read a lot of text, and we've only really read like eight verses, skimmed over a couple more, and there's a lot more to go. Um, but I hope we can see how hearing from Peter helps people understand what is going on. And I think a lot of that has to do with Peter's proxim close proximity to Jesus and his understanding of what was going on um, in learning about the kingdom of God, but also exactly what God was saying through Peter in that moment. And this is what Peter says in an answer to people who are trying to figure out how this miraculous gathering of hearing different languages but understanding had happened. And Peter actually has an answer for them. It starts in verse 14. This is where we get to see our second point for this morning, what it means to belong to the body of Christ. There's a shared understanding, there's a shared experience that helps us understand uh, just the ways of how God might be doing something in our midst together. And Peter explains that, starting in verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. 
even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if this gathering of people being together, trying to figure out what was going on, um, was to find some answer, Peter has a lot of wisdom for this group that's gathered together. And Peter, uh, he he cites the prophet Joel. Um, He knows Old Testament scriptures. But he also starts to put things together. And it has to be through the help and the power of past words he's heard Jesus speak before Jesus left the earth that you can read about in John 13 to 17, but also what God is saying to Peter in that moment. Because what Peter is saying about the coming of the Holy Spirit is coming true in this moment as they're gathered together. And what that shows is from Peter's close proximity with Jesus, but also the way that God was speaking to Peter, it was a way where Peter could help people understand what was going on. And so it shows how in this moment, in people's confusion, They needed to hear from someone who had the right perspective. Now, please don't get me wrong. The application of this is not for all of you to say, listen to me, Dan, your pastor, in all the things I have to say as your leader and as one of your preachers. That is one way that we experience what God is saying in the body of Christ. But it's certainly not the only one. But in this moment, when people were experiencing confusion, Peter had a role to play in the body of Christ to help people understand the confusion that's going on. And as I've been confused in my own thoughts and in my own emotions and also just in my own questions about all of the political things that are going on and how to make sense of them, especially from a Jesus-centered perspective, um, I have found it so meaningful uh, just to talk to someone I trust, someone who I talk about many times in sermons, but just a uh, 30-minute phone conversation with Greg Robertson, our elders, who was my youth, uh, one of our elders who was my youth group leader could help me understand and have good perspective about all of the different thoughts, fears, and anxieties that I'm experiencing in my mind at this time. It's a way where we get to be there for one another. And this was an important moment for Peter based on what he knew and also what he experienced and what God was saying to him in that moment could help care for others. Now, we have to be careful in saying that. Um, It doesn't mean that in every single moment we have the best wisdom to offer someone else. But at this moment in this confusion, it it becomes clear that God was speaking through Peter to help people understand a new era of the church is happening. We haven't experienced it before, but it's something that Jesus promised, and it's something that we can trust given what has been told to them in the past, given what has been prophesied from Old Testament prophets, and also given from what Peter had experienced in his conversations with Jesus, God gave him wisdom to help people understand what was going on in that moment. And at this moment, Peter was someone who could help people understand what was going on. And this is one, it's not the only, but it's one of many examples you will see in the book of Acts, how different people in the body of Christ have different roles to play to help uh, just people experience what it means to be the body of Christ. And so it's where we, um, as people are gathered together, um, do you notice how Peter plays this role? And we're going to see how just the community that's gathered together that begins the early church, that experiences this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, an era that I believe we're still in right now, the church era, the era of the Holy Spirit, where God speaks to us, his people, through his word and through the Holy Spirit, so that we might be able to just help people understand uh, from a wise perspective how to understand things from a God-centered perspective. And so um, I, I've really experienced this in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm sharing about how just talking to Greg, someone who's been a tremendous mentor to me, could help me during just all of my fears and all of my questions in this past week. Um, even when I consider my working relationship with Daniel as we pastor this, this congregation together, um, it's been a real blessing to see the ways that we have um, different interests and different Um, strengths and different weaknesses and how we can complement one another. Um, For example, I'm really thankful that Daniel reads a lot because I read uh, very little. And so then Daniel can share with me everything that he reads. And by that way, I can grow in my knowledge when most likely I'm not going to do it myself. 
it's been a tremendous blessing. Um, but what are the ways that God's gifted me as a super giant extrovert? I like talking to people. I like gaining just a lot of different um, perspectives and hearing people um, share and understand where people are at. And that doesn't mean that Daniel doesn't do that, um, because I know he does that too, but it's a way where we have different strengths that can complement one another. Um, If we're being honest, Daniel talks to people and listens to people in the same way that I enjoy doing it, far more than I read, if we're thinking about our weaknesses. But all that to say, we have so many different ways where God has gifted us in unique ways. And in this moment, Peter had a unique perspective based on his conversations with Jesus and his, uh, his understanding of what God had revealed to him through Old Testament scriptures that he could share with others. And one thing that we'll talk about more as we go along in our series is how vital each one of us is in the body of Christ and how we see that in a body, every body part is important. You see that in the book of 1 Corinthians, and we'll talk about that as we continue on in our series. But in this moment, Peter had something to offer to people. And it was a way where people could be pointed in the right direction, right? Now, in this gathering, one thing that we want to be careful about saying is, well, if Peter had this unique perspective to give to people based on just past knowledge, prior knowledge, and revealed knowledge, then, like, how do we know that Peter was right? How do we know that Peter was actually giving good wisdom and good guidance? Um, Or do we, like, and, and by extension of that, We could say, how do we know that the church is any different than any other group of people that's gathered together, right? Like, what makes the church unique and special in its ability to meet together as a group? We have sports teams. We have clubs that are centered around a particular interest. We have book clubs. We have all kinds of different things. We have video gaming crews. We have ways where we gather together where there is a shared and common interest. And there are so many, we have so many options in this technological age, even in a time where we can't see each other, maybe even more because we're on the internet so much more. How do we know that belonging to the body of Christ is something that actually has purpose beyond what a group of people gathered around a common interest has to offer? And Peter starts to hint at that in the last verse that we read where he says, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Peter has wisdom to share, but in his wisdom in doing so, what are we going to see that he does? And this brings us to our final point for this morning. He's focusing on the promise of Jesus Christ. He's showing who Jesus is. And that is the one thing that the church has that's unique to any other organization. There are good earthly organizations out there that might have fancy presentations, that might have a lot of resources, that might really capture our attention. What is it that the church has that we can look to for hope and a different kind of hope that can sustain us? And we have Jesus Christ, our Savior, the one who will one day make things right. And the one whose whose life and journey and presence as a Lord and Savior was so important back then And it can't be any less important for us right now in the the fears and the confusion that we face in our world right now. And so um, to illustrate this point, to see that what um, the body of Christ is doing is as they're listening to Peter, they're focusing on the promise of Jesus Christ. Um, I'm going to read everything that Peter says um, for the next 16 verses. Like I said, there's no way we can digest this in super great detail. But as you listen to this, Try to get an overall picture of what Peter's main point is and what he's saying. And after he says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, in verse 21, he continues by saying this, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. 
you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Pretty powerful speech. It's the, really the first sermon that the church heard, even though the church didn't necessarily know that it was the church yet. But if you, if you, if you can uh, kind of gather and grasp what Peter is saying. He's trying to, he's trying to uh, just help people understand who Jesus is, what has happened, that Jesus is in fact the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah. And what sets a church apart from another organization has to revolve around the person of Jesus. We have so many earthly ways to try to figure out how to cope with the challenges that we have in life. But the thing that makes the body of Christ unique is what the noun is, is what the description is describing the noun, the body, that it's the body of Christ. That the thing that, that unites us, the thing that binds us all together is the belief that Jesus Christ is our Savior. That he had power over death, that death could not hold him as we just sang a moment ago, but that he's risen and that we can understand that truth together. A supernatural and spiritual truth that we need in a world full of natural challenges and, conf and confusion. That was certainly true as the early church was getting started, and it's certainly true for us. When we think about tragedy as we have been through as a church, or when we think about the confusion that we see in the state of our nation, we often look for solutions. We look for laws to be passed that will make things better. We look for uh, like implementations of safety that might make things more safe in the future. But if you read the Bible from start to finish, and when we also consider the history of our world, our lives, our families' lives from start to finish, we can see there are earthly questions that seemingly have no answers. And yet the fact that Jesus saves, that, he wrote, that death couldn't hold him, that he gives us hope of a new life that we get to experience with him, if we know him, if he is our savior, that is where we find our ultimate hope. And in this first powerful sermon that the early church is hearing, Peter shares this hope with them. And what is the result? It actually helps lead in to these wonderful verses that are our theme verses, even before we get to verse 42, because this is the response starting in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And so in hearing this long speech from Peter about who Jesus is, what Jesus is about, and the hope that he brings, people ask the question, well, what should we do? And not in a practical way, not in a seeking answers and wisdom way, but in a way where they were moved by the, by the power of what God was saying through his servant Peter to say, how do we follow Jesus, this Savior? And if we are confused by our own thoughts, our own grief, our own challenges right now, or even if we're wondering about the state of our world, our nation, and how we might find answers. Shifting the way we are asking that question, what shall we do, 
is going to be so important. And we can experience that together as the body of Christ because we're centered around the one who actually has all the answers, Jesus Christ. And instead of saying, what shall we do to find earthly solutions? What can we say, what shall we do in response to the fact that Jesus is our savior, that death couldn't hold him, that he gave his life for us out of his great love and amazing grace that he wanted to show us? How can we then respond? And if that kind of focus shifts in our minds from going from looking for earthly solutions, for ways to cope with our earthly problems, where we can start to see where the God of this universe, who created this universe, but who out of love came down to want to be with us and show us what true love and true relationship really is. When we say, God, what can I do to be your servant? Even in the confusion and the grief and the the pain that I might feel at the start of this year, 2021. I believe we'll start to get to experience the powerful things that we see here. That many people open their hearts to this Jesus and that people want to repent, to turn towards him, to turn away from other earthly things, but to fix their minds and their hearts and their lives around Jesus. And God starts to do amazing things in their midst. And if that was true for the early church, given that there was so much confusion about their future and what had happened, certainly that is true for us today in all of the confusion that we feel rolling into the year 2021. And we see what makes this gathering different than any just, you know, group of a common interest, a sports team, a club, whatever it might be. The difference is that Jesus saves And when we gather together as the body of Christ, our common focus is our Savior, the one who has the power to save. And that is why being the body is so important for us at this point in our lives, at this point in history, and in our world. Many of us have been waiting for 2020 to end. We've been thinking, gosh, this year has been so uniquely challenging and terrible Once this calendar year flips, things will be better. But we need something more than that. That's an arbitrary thing. Those are dates and times. There's no actual power in it. But we need something more than that. We need to be close to the true Savior, the one that we can find hope in. Life doesn't just get better by the flip of the calendar. And in 2021, we will have joy. We will also have sorrow. We will have anxiety, but we can also experience peace. But in how chaotic our world has been, whether on a global or national stage or even in our personal, like, in our personal lives, the best way to be prepared is how Elder Rupert said it, to grow our faith in Christ. Now, that can be challenging for us if we are alone in our own thoughts. And we might put the burden of that uh, just as an individual responsibility where we feel, okay, what can I do to grow in my faith? And the more I do that, the harder I find it. But when I can start to share in that with my brothers and sisters around me, where we are out of just uh, the thing that ties us together, trying to point one another towards the love of God, towards the true salvation that we have in Jesus Christ, then we will grow our faith in Christ. And probably so much easier than, we just try to, than if we just try to do it on our own. And so when we look at the different elements of these verses, of this amazing fellowship that began as the early church began, I pray that as we fix our minds and, and, and our hearts collectively in pointing one another towards Jesus, um, as we discuss why we do the things that we do in our church, the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, prayer, all these different things that we see, in this this section, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, hopefully we will also get to see the awe that comes upon souls in verse 43, the signs and wonders that God wants to do in our lives. And hopefully our our eyes will be open and we, we will be open to what God is doing, that we will have more things in common than we ever have before, particularly praising God with one another. And also that we would get to see the power of God adding people to the kingdom of God, people being saved. Because really, that's the most important thing. When we consider how fragile our world is, as we've had to wrap our heads around death, more so than we would have liked, the fact 
that God adds to those being saved is something that we could experience is probably now more important than ever. And so as we consider this context of the early church, and as we start to consider what it means to be prepared, to grow our faith, to be the body of Christ, would you move to action, but action that isn't just your own way of doing it, but where you're in community with one another, where we wouldn't give up meeting together and we would consider that time so important. And can you see how belonging to the body of Christ points you in the right direction, especially in the areas where you might not have all the answers, where someone else might be able to help you within the body of Christ because of how uniquely we are created? And can you see how knowing Jesus is the most important thing that we could consider for us during this time? And I pray that as we spend time together, I pray that as we spend time looking into what it means to be the church, to be the body, that we will experience life to the full. And in a time where we might feel that hope is so far away for whatever reason, whatever difficult things are just clouding our judgment at this time, I pray that we would see that just as the early church experienced, that the power of Jesus Christ would be opening our eyes to seeing the hope that we have in him. Hope that we might not think is possible, but when you know Jesus, perhaps it can transform the way this year, 2021, is going to be for us. That we would be prepared, that we would grow in our faith in Christ. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that um, for this passage where we could see that in the midst of chaos and confusion, God, that you would reveal yourself to your people. That that was true thousands of years ago as the early church was beginning. And God, that that truth is so important for us right now at this moment in all the uncertainty that we face. So God, I pray, Lord, that as we look into what it means to be the body, why we gather together in the ways that we do, God, that you would be showing us the thing that, just the, the, the common ground that we have, our Savior Jesus Christ, and how a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with him can change the way we view everything. And God, ways I know that we are so desperately yearning for, given the state of our world, given the state of just our church, given the state of our individual minds and hearts. God, I pray that we would see the power of knowing you and that as the body of Christ, we would point one another towards you, towards that truth. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know.
God, we do sing hallelujah because we know you sent your son to this earth to die on the cross for us out of your amazing love and grace for us. And God, when we sing these words together as the body of Christ, it's a way where we get to remember who Jesus Christ is and the hope that that still has for us even right now at this moment. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to continually see what it means that you are glorified, not just right now in this moment, Looks not just in the moments following your death on the cross, but in just forever. No. Because that's who you are. And there is hope in that, that we know the living and eternal God. And God, that in the same ways that death did not hold you down, that we have hope that you are with us now 
heaven, and we will spend eternity with you in heaven. And so, God, I pray, Lord, that we would know the amazing love of our Father, our God, that we would continue to experience the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. And God, that as the body of Christ, we would get to see the ways that the Holy Spirit is in our fellowship and in our midst and helping us know that you are there, that you will help us navigate 2021, but that you've been with us long before that and you will be with us long after that. God, because of your amazing love, I pray that that would be something we experience as the body of Christ, that we can point one another back to you, the God who is forever glorified. So God, we love you. We thank you for this time. We pray this in Jesus' name.